Good morning, Soteria. You may, you may have a seat. If we've not met before, my name is Josh Smith, and I'm the director of growth groups here at Soteria. If uh, you're new to the church, you've likely heard from me over the past couple weeks or will hear from me over the next couple weeks as I try to get people connected into new groups and get some groups started and that kind of thing. So I'm excited to be able to have the opportunity this morning, though, to preach the word of God to you as we continue our sermon series in the land of the ology, the land of the ology. This entire sermon series, the whole premise of it is that we need to teach kids sound theology, right? We need it for ourselves, yes, but sometimes kids are going to ask some, some crazy questions and will leave us scratching our heads. Well, how is it that Jesus is fully God and fully man at the same time? What, what does that actually mean? And the whole point of this sermon series is not just to teach sound theology, but also to equip you as you teach kids, whether in children's ministry or in your home or when babysitting some, some kids in the neighborhood, whatever it is, Kids need to know sound theology, and as we continue through the sermon series, uh, I just want to do a little bit of review, see where we've been and where we're headed today. So we started off down south on, in the land of ology, and uh, we started in Scripture Springs. I forgot what it was called for a second. Uh, we started off in Scripture Springs because everything we do in theology, everything we do as a church flows out of God's unfailing, inerrant, perfectly reliable word. Everything we believe, everything we teach comes from God's word because God gave it to us and it's true because God is true. We, we moved on from there up north to Father's Falls where we talked about what what is God? What is the nature of God? He's, he's the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All three are, are one God, yet they are distinct in persons. And if you try to explain that to an 80-year-old, you're going to be confused, let alone to an, to an eight-year-old. So uh, I would just encourage you, that doctrine is so amazing, even though we can't comprehend it, because it teaches us that God is so much greater and beyond anything that we can think, feel, or touch in this world. And because of that, he is a God worth following. We moved on from there to Christ's Cove where we talked about Jesus and we focused in on what's called the hypostatic union. Jesus is truly God and truly man. Everything that's true about humanity is true about Jesus and everything that's true about God is true about Jesus. He is, that is the reason why we are able to say Christ intercedes for us. Christ can save us because he, as a human, died as a human and rose from the grave so that we might have fellowship with God. We went north again to Spirit's Grove and talked about the fruit of the Spirit, how the, the Spirit is not just some mystical force that, like karma or something like that, but instead he is a person that acts, that feels, that moves intentionally, fleshing out God's will in the world today. And last week we went on into the Shadowlands where we talked about other spiritual creatures that God made, the angels, the demons, Satan. We unpacked all of that and how God is sovereignly in control, orchestrating not just the actions of his heavenly armies, but also the demonic hordes that uh, act in this world and how God is using all of those to bring out final redemption in the end. And this sermon series, to, this sermon today, we're kind of taking a shift in the sermon series. We're moving from this spiritual realm of God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, angels and demons. We're moving out of that realm and into the present world in which we live. And the focus of today's message is going to be in the hills of humanity, where we talk about the doctrine of anthropology. This isn't some social study like cultural anthropology or social anthropology, but instead, we're going to dive into God's word and ask the question, what does the Bible teach about humans? What is a biblical anthropology? We're going to do that by jumping into primarily Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Genesis 1, uh, probably, let me guess, maybe page 1. 
in, in the pews in front of you or whatever it is that you have brought with you. Um, open up to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be focusing in on what it means to be human. So what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a human being? The Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, they have a division called the Human Origins Initiative. And you can go online to their website. Uh, they have this online forum that is continually going right now where you're able to submit a response to this very simple question, what does it mean to be human? Now, you know the Smithsonian. They don't believe things the, the way we believe here at Soteria. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. But here are some people's answers on, on this forum. They say, to be human is to be creative. To be human is to be creative. I mean, it's true. Humans are creative. Uh, we have art, we have music, we have uh, people developing new technologies and inventing things that can further the betterment of humankind. Uh, I praise the Lord I was able to drive here instead of walk in the heat uh, that we've been having recently. But is that the essence of what it means to be human? What about, what about this one? A human is a lucky organism whose genes worked for the environment. Now, this is the Smithsonian. Uh, they don't believe that there was a God who created the earth in six days a few thousand years ago, like we teach here at Soteria. They believe in uh, billions of years and evolutionary processes, which basically led up to humans just being a sad sack of cells, is, is what we are today, according to this view. And somebody else came along and tried to clarify this a little and said, a human is a bipedal hominid with a specialized jaw for communication. <laughs> and based off of all of those fancy schmancy words they used, I'm not sure their jaw is too specialized at, the, at that point. <clears throat> to be human is to be more civilized than other species or to be human is to be original and want to do the thing that you might be judged for. To be human is not to be entirely influenced by instinctual emotions, but also by the light of reason. Another says, to be human is to live life, make mistakes, and to gain knowledge and understanding through those mistakes. It reminds me of the old adage, I'm only human. What do we mean when we say, I'm only human? We mean we make mistakes, right? We fail, we have limitations, we have misgivings. And a lot of these answers that are given, they kind of point back to that general idea where we've equated humanity, what it means to be human, with sin's effects on humanity. We've equated being human with failure. We've equated being human with a failing and having misgivings, making mistakes. We've equated being human with being sinful. But is that the essence of what humanity actually is? And as I talk about what it means to be human, some of you might have your political wheels turning like, oh man, this is just going to be a political landfill today with minds all over, spread throughout, uh, with the doctrines that are currently being taught in the world about same-sex marriage and transgenderism. And these things will be addressed today. But you look throughout church history, and these questions are never addressed. They're never brought up. They're never really talked about that much. And I would argue that the reason why is because Humanity, the doctrine of humanity, has simply been assumed for the past several thousand years. We would look around and see, well, there's a man, there's a woman. That's what it means to be human. This is humanity. This is what it is. And they never really questioned it. But in today's world, there are so many questions being arisen about what it means to be a human that now we are starting to wrestle through this doctrine of anthropology in a very uh, minute sort of way. So there's a lot of things that are going into this. Uh, in 100 years, people are going to be looking back to the church of today as the ones that clarified and, 
and talked about and defined more clearly what the doctrine of anthropology actually teaches from Scripture. A hundred years from now, people are going to be looking back to the church right now as the ones who clearly defined what Scripture teaches in regards to gender, sexuality, human interaction, social, uh, social conundrums, cultural issues. The church today is the one defining that. You look through church history, and uh, you have these different creeds and confessions, but the early church never wrote a creed about what it means to be human. So let's jump in today. We're not going to be able to tackle every single issue in depth because this is an overview, 30,000 foot approach to it. And we're going to be focusing in primarily on Genesis chapter one through three. But I want you to know this, orthodoxy, True teachings about scripture are forged in the fires of heresy or false teaching. As false teaching arises within the church, as false teaching arises within the culture, the church is then confronted with a false teaching. And they say, what does scripture actually teach? And that's where we are today with this doctrine of anthropology. All of these false teachings are arising, and we have to ask the question, what does Scripture actually teach, and stay true to God's Word, whatever it says? Amen? Amen. So let's ask the question then, what does it mean to be human according to Scripture? If you are... Uh, have been a Christian for many years, you can ask this question and you, have likely, you likely have this trump card that you can play. Well, a human is an image bearer of God. Nothing else in all creation is made in God's image. And this is true. And you actually find that on the, the online forum with the Smithsonian. Random people, you had these answers scattered throughout. What is a human? An image bearer of God. And they wrote this out on the, on the forum. But that also leaves us with a question, what is the, the image of God? What is the image of God? We, we talk about this image of God, but I don't think many of us actually have wrestled through and tried to understand what does it actually mean to be an image bearer? What is God's image in us? And because of that, I don't think many Christians today have, have any idea what it actually means to be human, rather than this abstract term of the image of God. So what, it, what does it mean to be human is a good question, but a better question that we're going to try to answer this morning is what is the image of God? What is the image of God? And how we're going to tackle this is we're going to look at three main categories, three main categorical views that people have had throughout church history as to what is the image of God. They have three main categories, and there will be a few subpoints underneath each one trying to detail what the, uh, trying to outline what people have taught regarding the image of God. And we're going to do that. And then we're going to take that view and look back at Genesis 1 through 3 and see, do we, and ask, do we see this view of the image of God within Genesis 1 through 3? Does that sound like a plan? We're going to jump in. Here are the views. Here's what Genesis 1 says. Do we see this view within how God originally created humanity to be? <clears throat> so we start off on this hike through the hills of humanity, and the first mountain we come across is this place called Mount Substance. This is the first category that people teach. The image of God, they say, is the substance of what we are as humans. It is our essence. It is what we are as human beings. And there are a couple of different views within this, but uh, we see this primarily from in Genesis 1. We'll start in verse 26 and, and move through some of these verses. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. He created them male and female. God put his image in us, 
And because of how God is creating, God created birds, he created plants, he created the sun, moon, and stars, he created the water, the land that we walk on, all of the raw material in this universe, and all of the creatures that exist here on planet Earth, from the smallest bacteria to the largest whale, God created all of them in physical ways. He created them as matter composed of cells, molecules, atoms. All of God's creation is composed of these uh, molecules and these, this matter, except for angels, basically. And because of that, one of the most natural ways to read the image of God uh, in this passage is by talking about the body. Is the image of God the body? This is something that has been heavily debated throughout church history, um, mainly because they see this view as something that could uh, be an affront to God. Because God, he, he doesn't have a body. He is a spirit. He is, he is a soul. God is spirit. Therefore, the image of God cannot be something physical. And uh, this actually, I think, comes primarily out of an old heresy called Gnosticism. This Gnosticism t taught that only what is spiritual is good. Everything in the physical world is evil. Now, I'm, I'm summarizing it in a nutshell. But everything physical is wrong and bad. And one day we will be uh, brought back into perfect spirituality and we will no longer have bodies. They have demonized what it means to be physical. And they say, because God is spirit, the image of God cannot be the body. But you look through this text and God created a physical human being. God created a physical human being, and our God is a creative God. You look throughout the Old Testament, the New Testament, God is described in several different ways. He's described as being someone who hears our prayers. He's described as someone who smells the beautiful aroma of a life lived sacrificially for him. He's described as being someone who speaks to us primarily through his word. And we have God's word with us today because God is a speaking God. He is described as a, a father who um, corrects his children. He's described as a mother who lovingly wraps her, her arms around their children. He's described as a warrior who uses his hand to grab a battle sword or uh, make a fist to squash his en enemies. And could it be that G God is this way? I mean, could it be that we are created with this particular form to reflect in a physical way the way God is in a spiritual way? God created us with ears because he hears. God created us with a hand, with a thumb, so we could grab a gun because he is a warrior. Amen? God created us with hands that can work tools and create things and fashion things because he is a creating God. God, our bodies are created in a way to reflect God's spiritual nature. And because God created humanity in a physical way, you could say that the image of God is the body. But is that all the image of God is? Because God didn't just create humans with a body. You see in Genesis 2, 7, that the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. This idea of breathing the breath of life into humans isn't just air flowing in and out of our lungs and uh, making blood th flow through our bodies, collecting oxygen. But it's also, if you remember back to pneumatology, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the same word for spirit is the word for breath. We were created with a soul as well. And here in Genesis 2-7, God isn't just making us breathe. He is giving us a spiritual existence as well. And that's the second view of what the image of God is within Mount Substance. You have the soul. You have the soul. Is the image of God the fact that we have a soul? 
No other creature on the earth has a soul. Um, and God is a spirit, so it would be right to assume that we have a soul and that that is the image of God as well. But is that all that it is? Another view within the, the substantive view is that it is our intellect. It is our intellect. No other creature can think, communicate, deduce, rationalize in the same way that human beings can. And the only other, uh, and God, he created us to be rational creatures. We, we see in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 31, that God gave a command to be followed. God gave a command to be followed. And we see later on in the passage that uh, he also gave responsibility and authority. He said, let them rule, let them rule, subdue the, the creation that has been given. That requires intentional, active thinking to, and to be able to analyze and respond properly to what God has given in creation. You move on to Genesis chapter 2, and uh, God gives another command. He tells them, he tells Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, because if you eat of it, you will surely die. He, uh, he gave this command, and they had a choice between right and wrong with morality as well. And more than that, you see later on in chapter 2, we see this. <clears throat> The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. God, right before this, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. So what did he do? He brought a bunch of animals before him so that he could name, him, name them. And as he was doing that, Adam realized, hey, all, all these boy animals have a lady friend, but... I don't have a lady friend. God didn't just do this uh, so that he could name all of the animals, but God made him name the animals so that he could logically deduce that he was missing something. He was missing something. And God created us as these rational creatures to be able to think, reason, and have intellect. But is that what it means? Is that the essence of humanity? We move on after hiking over Mount Substance and we make it to Mount Function. Mount Function. This is the view, the categorical view that uh, the image of God is not found in what we are, but it's found in what we do. It's found in what we do. God did give us commands to follow. He did give us morality. And we've uh, addressed that a little bit, but we see here in Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17, um, this this same thing we just read with the, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave them a choice between right and wrong. God is the image of God found in what we do, in following God's commands, in obeying what he has commanded us to do, in ruling over creation. We hike over Mount Function and we make it to the, the third hill in the hills of humanity, Mount Relation. Mount Relation. This is the view that it's the image of God is not found in what we are. It's not found in what we do. Instead, it's found in how we relate to others. And in particular, the views that we have here are that um, we have relation to God. We have relation to God. This is the, the main view within Mount Relation. Is it that we are able to relate to God? because no other animal relates to God in the way we do. Uh, we have in Genesis chapter 3, the, this passage that says, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the way this is worded makes it seem like it's a regular thing that God would do. God would stoop down and walk in the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, creating them for relationship, creating them for relationship with him. Uh, no other creature has the capacity to worship God in the way we do. No other creature has the capacity to pray to God the way that we do. But is this what the image of God is? You also have the view within Mount Relation that it is our relationship to others, to other humans. 
God created us for community. God created us for community with one another. When he created us, he created us male and female to relate to one another. And then later on in Genesis chapter 9, it's talking about the image of God, and it talks about how the social world is constructed. We relate not just as husband and wife or as man and woman, but also as communities, as cultures. We relate to others in these particular ways, as friends as well, co-workers, merchants, marketplace things. God created all of these so that we could have relationship with others. And you look through Genesis 1 through 3, you can kind of see every single one of these views, and you can see why people argued for, for these particular views as to what the image of God actually is. So which is it? Let's, let's take a step back and look at it from another perspective. Instead of asking the question, what is the image of God? Let's look at it from the other way and say, if this view is the image of God, then is anybody left out? And what are the ramifications ethically, culturally, if this view of the image of God is correct? So we start off back at the hills of humanity in Mount Substance. You have the body, the soul, the intellect, which we start with the body. If the body alone is the image of God, then this is, this is actually something that has been abused by, by Christians in the past. Uh, there are cultures in the world today that have been Christianized, uh, but they've still tried to hold on to some of their old religions, and they say if someone is born with a disability or a missing appendage or uh, something like that, then they do not have the image of God. And in fact, the, uh, they were cursed by a demon or something like that. There are cultures in the world that still believe this. And then we actually see this kind of idea in Scripture a little bit by the Jews who approached Jesus when a blind man came. And uh, they asked him, who sinned Jesus, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What terrible atrocity did these guys do to make this man born bl be born blind? And you see, they're equating those kind of things. But if the body alone is the image of God, then there are some people who might not be considered in the image of God. What about Siamese twins? There were uh, slave owners in early America that used this as a way of justifying their ownership of black slaves because the color of their skin didn't match up with uh, having the image of God. These kind of things legitimately happened, and because of a faulty view of the image of God, people were hurt, abused, and mistreated. The same thing goes for the soul. Uh, within the doctrine of, of the soul, there is this question of when did humans get the soul? There are a couple of views. I'm going to just summarize them real quick. One view, and the view that we, we believe and primarily teach here at the church, is that we were, born, we were uh, conceived with a soul. And at the moment of conception, at the moment of fertilization, every single one of us has not just a, a cellular makeup, but also a spiritual makeup, and that that is passed on from the parents. We all have a soul from the very moment we are conceived. On the other side of things, you have people that say, no, the soul isn't given till later. It's not given until like the third trimester or even when uh, children are born. Some would go so far and, and say that the soul isn't given to someone until the age of accountability, whatever that is. That's, that's for another time. We're not going to jump in there today. Uh, but they would say somewhere between the ages of three and five, sometimes even 12 years old, the soul isn't given until that age of accountability. And there are some churches today who believe that doctrine and say, because the soul isn't given till later, we are perfectly justified in slaughtering millions and millions of unborn children. And scripture is so far from that. 
the soul is something we, we get from the very beginning. So even with this, this doctrine, there can be some uh, people who try to justify atrocities committed against humankind because of a faulty view of the image of God. You move on to the intellect, and there are countries today that uh, pride themselves as having cured Down syndrome. And all they mean by that, as a, a father of a son with Downs, this drives me nuts and makes me angry because all they mean is that they have successfully aborted every single child uh, that could have been born with Down syndrome over the past 10 years. That is a cruel, terrible thing that God is going to judge. And because of a faulty view of the image of God, this could be justified. What about people with cognitive disabilities? Or, um, or problems with some mental health issues? Are, are these people in the image of God? What about on, on Mount Function? The, uh, I'm not going to get off on some in, environmental thing, but God gave us a responsibility to take care of the earth and uh, to rule over the earth. Humans have done a great job of that, I think, over the years, but there are also some areas that humans need to, to be better at. If, if people are abusing the earth, does that mean they're not in the image of God because they're not obeying God's command at the uh, original creation? What about any of us, for that matter, as people who are sinners? We have all rebelled against God, and we are all morally reprehensible and spiritually dead in our sins. Does that mean that we aren't in the image of God anymore? On Mount Relation... We are all separated from God because of sin. Does that mean none of us are in God's image or, or that only Christians are in the image of God because we have fellowship with God through Christ? Or what about relationships with others? Um, because of this passage here in Genesis 1, some people would say you are not fully in the image of God until you are married. God created uh, his image as male and female. What about marriages that break up and there's a divorce? What about people who take the view to others and they say, um, because society is broken and some societies are more broken than others, then this society might be in God's image because they're doing some good things, but this society is not because they are uh, culturally debased and terrible. So which view of the image of God is correct? At this point, you might be scratching your heads, well, are, are any of them correct? And that's kind of where I want you to be, because if we take a step back, zoom out, and look at the hills of humanity as a whole, what a human is, what a human does, how humans connect, every single one of them represents the image of God. And the key truth I want you to see from today's sermon is that all of humanity is made in God's image. All of humanity is made in God's image. This isn't just what we are. This isn't just what we do. It isn't just how we relate to others. But the image of God is every aspect of humanity as God created it to be. All of human experience, all of how we look, all of how we relate, all of, how, all of the things we do, all of those are the image of God. It's like if I asked you, what is the image of Josh? What is the image of Josh? Some of you who, uh, who have not met might say, well, he's a redhead, so he's got that strike against him. Uh, so that, that's the image of Josh. Josh is a redhead. Some of you who know me a little better might say, Josh is married to, to charity, and uh, he loves his wife dearly, and that is the image of Josh, his marriage to his wife. Some of you might say he's a father to, to Gus and to Matthew. I almost forgot the second one's name for a second. Uh, this is embarrassing. But... Um, <laughs> 
That might be the image of Josh, as him as a father. It could be the image of Josh as he uh, tries to connect people in groups, what he does here at the church. It could be the fact that I really, really love pizza and that my favorite pizza place in the city is Parlor Pizza in Beaverdale. And if you've not been, you should go. It's outstanding. Uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, it's, it's delightful. Um, but you, you could say that is the image of Josh. And every single one of you who said any of these things would be correct. That is the image of Josh. But the, but the problem is, is that not one of them is the full image of Josh by himself. All of the images need to be brought together for the image of Josh to be fully realized. And if our God is an infinite God, Every single one of us is a picture of what God is. We are an image of God in what we do, in what we say, in how we relate to one another. All of us are in God's image, but only when we're all together can we truly see all of the nature of God. But we also run into another problem. We are only human. We do make mistakes, and we sin, and we fail, and does that mean that the image of God isn't actually in any of us anymore? Have we lost the image of God because of sin? And you, you look over at Genesis 9, verses 1 through 6. God blessed Noah and his sons after the flood. Uh, he wiped out all of humanity because they were only wicked all the time. But Noah found righteousness with God, and God blessed them after the flood, after surviving it on the ark, and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear and terror of you will be in every living creature on the earth, every bird of the sky, every creature that crawls on the ground, and all the fish of the sea that are placed under your authority. Every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave the green plants, I have given you everything. However, you must not eat meat with its lifeblood in it, and I will require a penalty for your lifeblood. I will require it from any animal and from any human. If someone murders a fellow human, I will require that person's life. Whoever sheds human blood, by humans his blood will be shed. Why? For God made humans in his image. Even after the flood, when all of humanity uh, was erased and restarted with Noah and his family, Every single person on the planet was a sinner, and yet God says the image of God is still there. So sin, it doesn't remove the image of God, but instead what it does is it's like this creeping moss that grows over what it actually means to be human. It clouds what being human actually is. It, it clouds the image of God. It twists it. It distorts it into something else. But the image of God is still there. It's just covered up with something else, with sin. So all of us have God's image, even as sinners, but we don't fully represent who God is because of our sin. So the question is, how can our, how can we be brought back into the full image of God? How can we remove the moss so that the beauty of God's image once again shines out of us and our communities and our societies only through someone else who is able to make us back into God's image? And we read this in Colossians 1.15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We read in Hebrews the, that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. God created, uh, Jesus was born 2,000 years ago as a legitimate human, truly human, 100% human, whatever way you want to say that. Jesus was as human as we are, only he didn't have that sin that was covering up the image of God. So in a sense, we can look at Jesus and say, that is what true humanity actually is. We can't truly understand what it means for us to be human unst until we see Jesus in his humanity. Because Jesus, as the perfect image of God, was the perfect human being. 
It wasn't just that he was God. It was that in his humanity, he was the perfect embodiment of the image of God and his image shone out like no one else in all of creation. So how do we then become back into this image? We become back into this image through, through Jesus alone. We read in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it's talking about, uh, this passage is talking about Moses as he went up to get the Ten Commandments. He came back down after being in the presence of his God and his face shone uh, visibly. And so they put a bag on his head, not because he was ugly, although that could have been the case too. I mean, uh, he had a pretty gnarly beard, I'm sure, but um, mainly because his face shone, and they were terrified. And then it says here, because of Jesus working us, we all, with unveiled faces, no bag over our heads, we are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Jesus, because of what he did, and because of the Holy Spirit working in us, they are removing the moss from our souls, from our bodies, from our human existence, and are bringing out the true image of God once more as we live for Christ. And it will one day be accomplished where in... Uh, oh, my bad. In Romans 8... We read this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined for what purpose? To be conformed to his image, the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. When Jesus comes back, all of the sin, all of the difficulty that is covering up the image of God is going to be fully removed. And the image of God will fully shine out from us as God originally created it to be at the beginning. Jesus. He died on the cross, taking that sin that covers the image of God on himself and rose victoriously from the grave three days later so that we could once again be brought into this perfect fellowship with God so that we could have glorified bodies when he returns so that our soul is alive and vibrant so that our bodies are no longer riddled with decay and disease and uh, disability so that our minds are perfect as God intended them to be all of this is true in Christ because he is the image of God and he brings that back out of us through faith alone in what he has done on the cross. Amen? Amen. One day, every single one of us will have the scales removed and the image of God will shine forth because of what Jesus has done for us. And all of humanity is made in God's image. All of humanity is made in God's image and Christ is beckoning us back to him, back to this perfect image that we were created for that has been twisted by sin. So as we conclude this sermon today, I want you to take out a connect card take out a connect card, and you can fill that out. Uh, we would love to contact you. But on the back, I just want you to answer one question. The Smithsonian, they asked the question, what does it mean to be human? And that is a great question. It is a question we should wrestle with. But it's not just what does it mean to be human. I want you to answer this question instead. In Christ, what does it mean to be human? In the true image bearer of God, the perfect image bearer of God, what does it mean to be human? Take a moment and, and fill that out, and afterwards, Pastor Aaron is going to come up, and we are going to partake in the Lord's Supper together.